Greetings, John. Lovely to see you. How are you? I'm good, buddy. It's good to see you too. It's been too long. I can't even remember the last time you and I caught up in the real world. Um, or even the last time I was in Scotland. I really miss Scotland. I can't wait to go back. Last time I was there actually in Scotland was uh, for my birthday, like two years ago. I went out with my wife just for, for my birthday. Um, you, you but it's good to see you, man. Pop, pop back in. I think actually it was about 15 years ago uh, we saw each other <sighs> up in Scotland. Um, a different life in those days. But uh, listen, London's out of lockdown. I'm a bit jealous. We've got another week to go. How does it feel and how are you feeling? It feels good. You know, I mean, the, the city is bustling. And I think it's because non-essential retail got to open up. People, I think, are eager to get out and consume again. And they're being sensible. The amount of people wearing masks. The galleries have reopened for Maddox. Um, and the response has been phenomenal. We, the first day that we opened, or the first 48 hours that we opened, we were working with a brand new artist called Ross Muir, who's actually from Scotland. And he, he had a bunch of work with us and the work sold out within like less than 24 hours. So, you know, people are eager to get out and consume and experience art again. And, and the city in general is, is bustling. You know, I mean, you know, if I look out, it's not a ghost town um, like it was a few months ago. People are enjoying consuming again. And I, I actually think you can see the faces of the hospitality team in London, they're smiling, you know, they're happy to, what can I get you? <laughs> you know, it's, there's such joy and it's nice, you know, I think, and, and the good thing is people aren't taking it for granted. Everyone is being relatively sensible, wearing masks and being respectful of each other's space. It's a, it's a brave new world. And I don't think anything's going to go quite back to normal the way it has been, but it's also, it's also going to feel different and it's going to feel better and, and more enjoyable as we move forward now. No, we can't, we can't wait. And, uh, I mean, Maddox was already a very digitally focused business um, and a little bit like ourselves. Uh, we have a real strong e-commerce um, part of our business, but we're an experiential business at the end of the day. You know, our, our uh, locations, we have our champagne bars, we have our lounges. I mean, people, you know, people love that experience. And, and we're seeing mm -hmm. that. We saw that when we reopened before Christmas yeah. time that we had that pent up demand. Um, and I guess uh, for Maddox, it's much the same way, but how's the pandemic um, impacted your business and how has it changed the way you showcase and sell art? You know, it, it, the Maddox is prides itself on new and innovative ways that people can consume and experience and ultimately purchase art. And when the pandemic hit back last March of 2020, we immediately looked at it through the lens of, first and foremost, we realized a lot of people are going to be sitting at home, not knowing what to do with themselves. You know, we, we've, we've dramatically underestimated how convenient it was to go out on the weekend to the pub and all this sort of stuff. And also people are sitting at home. And what are they doing? They're on social media and they're consuming. And we realized that there is, this isn't, you know, a, a token thing that people like to do. People like to go to galleries and museums and they like to experience things. And re by removing that from them, there was, there was a real void. So we created, you know, we explored, you know, virtual reality solutions. We explored, explored uh, you know, re remote solutions where people could sort of you know, come in and do anything from a Matterport experience of the gallery, which is a 3D tour of the gallery. We created completely bespoke virtual reality spaces where the work was hanging at, at you know, at 8K resolution quality. Um, you know, we, I remember there was one space that we created for David Yarrow, uh, you know, a, another famous Scotsman who, uh, you know, one of our best fine art photographers, David, we created this experience for David and, uh, you know, you get to view his, his images in 8K, but the entire space was fictional. It was a virtual reality construct. And we got people complimenting going, wow, your gallery is gorgeous. I mean, it looked real. <laughs> and so, um, and, you know, people would consume that way and, and people were comfortable buying. A lot of people were, were, I mean, an extraordinary amount. They were sitting at home and realizing, oh, I've always wanted to get something, you know, to, I've, I've either wanted to get something for that wall in our room. I want to get a present for my wife. And, and then a lot of people, you know, with, with, with the, you know, the right levels of savings income decided, I want to start putting my energy into creating a portfolio of art. You know, I really want to be a genuine collector and, you know, there's a passion for it. Not, not too dissimilar to collecting watches. There's a, there's an extraordinary passion for it. And has the last 12 months opened you up to new audiences within the UK and globally? I mean, one thing that we've seen obviously with, with London having such a big market share of the watch and jewelry market, 
with effectively London really being closed for international travel retail in the yeah. last 12 months. There's, you know, there's been a real big refocus by the watch brands and the jewelry brands and what's happening domestically. And this is what we've seen. We've seen the sort of um, two halves. The regions have actually performed quite well when the shops have been opened. Um, cities like you know, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Newcastle, Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, these, you know, Birmingham, these big cities where you know, people are still shopping. And, and, the, and the, there's been this big shift from, from London. And I've always had this kind of issue, being a regional operator, and there's always a talk about London, 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 everything's happening in London. You've got Harrods, you've sure. got Selfridges. Um, and, and you know, I think people, a lot of people have, have forgotten that actually there is a lot of wealth in the regions. Um, and people do enjoy luxury. And it's put the spotlight back on the, the, the sort of regional markets. And I'd be interested I mean, to hear how that's how that's actually you know if that's if you've seen that trend. Listen, I mean, I think you 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 couldn't be more right. There was a desire originally that all roads lead to London. Um, you know, you've even got people from other countries who will only buy art in London. You know, they've got perfectly fine galleries in their backyard um, and phenomenal local artists. But you you travel to the mecca, you travel to London to purchase your art or or, or your luxury goods. Uh, and what we found is the there is that strong desire to consume, you know, art. Um, even you know, this translates to luxury goods in, in the regional areas. You can still tap into that by having an effective, um, you know, remote strategy. And and that that begins first and foremost with you know social media. And and we found, and I'm glad you have found it too, an, an incredibly strong desire. You know, the appetite hasn't hasn't you know softened at all uh, hasn't weakened at all uh and internationally i mean one of the things that maddox does very well is we've got some very impressive galleries and nothing beats the experience of coming into the gallery yet when you can't come to the gallery the experience of the journey the customer journey for maddox the client journey the collector journey for maddox is by no means weakened you know, you still feel that, you know, it's not just an online experience, it's a Maddox experience. And that's the critical part of whenever you're selling anything that is at a significant price point, whenever you're tapping into luxury, you have to distinguish yourself from any other sort of e-tailer that's out there. You have to distinguish yourself from the, the Amazons of the world. And the only way to do that is to really make it feel for every client that there's a journey they're going to experience and 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 no obviously the go-to and you and i i remember you and i discussing this 15 years ago about what is the experience in rocks when someone walks in everything from the way the staff are dressed to the you know the sense the five senses of retail and you know the, the same thing now applies online and just and and that that comfort that's required that experience is required really gives security to people thinking you know what i'm going to invest i mean we've had people spending um extraordinary amount on phenomenal art just like i'm sure you do with with jewelry and watches entirely online and that can only be done if there's confidence in a safe and enjoyable experience a branded experience online and that that's complemented with you know, an effective, I mean, one of the things we do incredibly well is social media, and that's, it's got to be complemented with an incredibly effective social media strategy, which is inviting people into a, into a, an ecosphere, um, you know, into, into an ecosystem, to a stratosphere of, 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 of how we communicate and what that brand means. No, and, and I've seen you talk about the white glove delivery approach, because it's all well and good, mm. you know, showing the products in a virtual environment, and then, of course, they see it, they buy it. But the most important part then is, of course, when they receive the goods. And we've, we've adopted the same policy where, you know, significant purchases, we do have that white glove delivery experience where we bring it to the customer, we do the handover, we explain. And, and I guess you guys have had to do the same as well because you can't just you know, pop it into a raw bale parcel and send it in the post to the customer. You, not you're not, not always, unfortunately. You know, yeah, not always, gotta, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, um, the, 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 key, the key thing here is we... Uh, uh, you know, what interesting for me and to compliment a, a completely, you know, going off topic for a second, completely a, a different brand. Um, I had a Peloton delivered during the pandemic. And, you know, it, essentially it's, a, it's just basically a bike. You know, it's nothing. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can easily dismiss it, you know. Uh, but the, the experience was phenomenal. You know, they came in the, in the Peloton branded van. They, the, the gentlemen who stopped out were both incredibly well-polished, but they're in essentially tracksuits. 
Um, incredibly well presented, well spoken. You could see that the people who enjoyed what they were doing, they enjoyed the bike, they clearly got one themselves, or they certainly demonstrate that. And, you know, with our technicians, when they drop off artwork, these are technicians who actually have experience. They're not, you know, guys who could work for, you know, any career company. These are experienced, well-trained people in, in identifying the best place to hang artwork. They can speak eloquently about the artwork, but not in a salesman type way. They, they can talk about their, I mean, I've got technicians who are actually artists. You know, they're just making money on the side while they're trying to burgeon their art career. That that level of passion is what is required when you can't offer the equivalent of a white glove service. Though, you know, we do have, you know, the, the, the staff go out and we, we actually have with Maddox black gloves because it just suits the branding. They come with the black gloves and, and they've got the black uniform. Um, and uh, it's, it's a little bit more... Uh, uh, labor intensive delivering artwork especially if you're delivering like a giant yarrow or a, or, or or a large you know harlan miller or, or, or anything that you know depending what you what, you, what you're having delivered um and especially if it's coming framed they're weighty they're weighty pieces um you know during the pandemic i probably had three or four pieces installed in my home and and that you know very quickly that can be a you know a, a, you know a strenuous exercise but it's all part of that experience and the technicians are great because they, they they talk about the artwork with the clients and they know when to back off if the clients aren't interested but it, they're, they're they're intelligent about it you know so when something gets delivered the, the the technicians are fully aware of the history of the artist and the piece itself and that's that's very important because i think that complements the entire experience I mean, the, the one challenge I guess we've had with selling our product um, and our, our jewelry and our watches online is people love to touch jewelry. They love to see it. They need to see the inherent beauty in it and the finish. Um, and that's always been, there's always going to be a challenge in our industry, I think, to, to translate that to, to, um, to digital retail. But I guess with, with art, it's yeah. much easier to, to see. But I guess you, you still, if you see it in person, you get that, that reflection. You get, there's elements you can't quite, you know, do on uh, do online um, too for you, but your galleries are open. You know, how and what would you be doing differently now after the pandemic? Um, you know, putting aside the obvious uh, safety concerns that need to be respected, because we we still are in a pandemic. It's just after lockdown, um, and and we all have to be you know respectful of that. Um, the uh, the key thing is is finding ways to bring people back to the galleries. I mean, we don't even have to aggressively promote the galleries being open. The amount of people that messaged us after the prime minister's last announcement saying, "Do I have to book an appointment? Can I just come in?" Uh, was extraordinary. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about just a few. I'm doing literally hundreds of emails. You know, can I come in this Thursday? Do I need to book an appointment? Right. And uh, you know, you don't have to book an appointment to come to Maddox at the moment. Um, uh, thankfully, you know, with the way that we're open, we, we can control the, uh, you know, the, the volume of people coming into the gallery at any given time. And we, we're sensitive to it. But the, the, the critical thing now is how do we reintroduce exhibitions and events, the opportunity, because nothing beats being able to meet with an artist and actually talk to an artist. This is the person who created this work. Uh, because the authenticity of, of, of a piece, the brilliance of a piece is so well complemented when you speak directly to an artist and you, you just get to hear that passion in their voice, you know, and, and, and get to hear their strategy by why this was created and then get the assurance that this is something that was a one off. It's not a commercial, you know, uh, device that I'm going to print millions of this, th this image, but this is something rare, unique. I've made it and now I'm willing to sell it and essentially give it to someone else to have in their home. It's the beginning of a journey and, and it's not trying to make it more romantic than it is because that's the journey that, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring and Richard Hambleton, all these artists who are phenomenally, you know, sought after artists now in, in their deaths um, and their work is extraordinarily expensive. It began with them deciding to create something and then share it with the world. So our goal is to, bring people into the galleries, have experiences where we've, we're going to recommence artist talks. We're going to recommence um, our artistic director talks and, uh, and, and just generate um, a welcoming feeling for people to come back and visit and experience, you know, an, an eclectic range. And, and this year alone, we've got at least, I think off the top of my head, six solo exhibitions planned with artists from around the world. Um, you know, I'm very much looking forward to the Mia's brothers, and uh, incarcerated Jerry Face, who's a phenomenal street artist uh, out of the uh, East Coast, 
Um, they're the two next exhibitions. And there's no doubt in my mind, based on the waiting list for those works, for those artists, that the, both those shows will sell out probably within the first hour that they open. Uh, and it, it's a phenomenal position to be in. You know, not only do we have some extraordinary artists, but they're extraordinary artists that are exclusive to Maddox and the, the popularity is, uh, is phenomenal, you know. I mean, who would have believed, you know, 12 months ago that we would have had, you know, the shops and galleries closed for, I mean, in, in Scotland, actually, in Glasgow, we've been closed for about eight months throughout the, the whole year, mm. but we've had to adapt, we've had to work out a yeah. way of operating and that's just, that's human nature, isn't it? I just, you know, we were terrified at the beginning because we had no idea how long this would go on. And I remember somebody saying to me, well, budget for 12, 12 weeks of closures, you know, and at that time it was terrifying, but, you know, we've adapted, mm -hmm. we've worked and, and we're still here um, and customers are still shopping and we're expecting this, this uh, roaring 20s, the boom, as they've all been talking about now. And, 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 I, and we've seen it, you know, our stores in England are actually open this week, so it's been busy and I'm really pleased. But, you know, we've, we've, we've all had to adapt to digital the thing I've missed the most of the, of the last 12 months is events, like you've mentioned there. I mean, we've always been very active yeah. with events, engaging with our customers, you know, bringing the brands into our stores, presenting product, um, doing things completely differently um, has always been our hallmark. Um, but what do you think the future holds for luxury retail now? We've had this reset. Um, clearly, things are going to be different going forward. Um, but, you know, not looking at this year, looking in a couple of years' time, you know, the experiential retail model for us is, is clearly still here. You, you know, you need that as well. There is be underpinned by a strong digital offering, but I'd be interested to see what you think the future holds. Listen, you know, I don't know if you remember, you know, 15 years ago when we were, we were at Las Vegas, you know, the conferences and, you know, we, and, you know, we, and, 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 and you know, and even when I come to Scotland, we talk about the future of luxury retail back then. I mean, this is 2005. Mm -hmm. 2006 you know was it has to be experience driven and it was looking at everything from you know what what is the what is the journey when you walk into a into your to your store into your location to you know now it's evolved beyond that we i mean the we, we look at every micro facet of, of the consumer journey at Maddox from the e the first email that you receive as part of an email nurturing program to the social media journey. I mean, everything gets examined. I think the future for luxury is very, very strong. I mean, extraordinarily strong. People will always want to have uh, and acquire and desire to own, you know, luxury items, whether it's watches, cars, artwork, jewelry. The future of the industry has to be has to be about the experience. And I think those experiences will be by appointment only. They'll be smaller in capacity, but they'll be much more potent, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, I, I remember Rock's doing it. We, we certainly do it. We, we have a few hundred people into the gallery location for the launch of an artist. We've got celebrities coming, we've, you know, we've got Cara Develine, De um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, you know, cast of Game of Thrones coming in. I mean, it's just, you know, it's phenomenal. It becomes a bit of a party, a bit of a socialite event. Uh, I, I think those days will be a while before they return. But what will happen in the first instance will be more sophisticated uh, and 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 more intimate experiences for clients. Where you know, one of the things I'd like to do uh, this year is to do a dinner in the gallery. We, we've done them before, but that's a nice intimate dinner in the gallery where we have you know two dozen people come in it's certainly dramatically less than a couple of hundred people pushing their way through our Maddox Street location which is with the gorgeous facade it's a brilliant location to visit but it's 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 a very different experience to have two dozen people at a dinner and last I mean one of the, one of the ones the dinners that we had you know we had Serena Williams here it was shot you know it was done around Wimbledon um, you know, the attention was phenomenal. That sort of intimate experience, I think, is the future where people are coming in and, and it's, a, it's, it's less is more, but doing more of those, if that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're exactly the same. I share your view completely. And <laughs> dinners, experiences, just creating that real emotional connection with the customer. But I think you're right, they're going to be on a smaller scale, more intimate, and as you, as, as you said, more potent. So let's roll back the clock. I mean, 15 years ago, um, we had some great times together. Um, you've had a really interesting career. Tell us about it. And how did you end up working at Maddox? 
<laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, we obviously met because uh, I, I was working in um, handling international operations for a, for a fairly large diamond company and um, uh, and 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 part of their international sales team. And uh, you know, the, the journey has been um, extraordinary. I mean, I, I'm so thankful to that experience with you know Heart Supplier and then the, the, the beers and 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 to 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 enjoy that experience and 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 brought me over to England because you know I was in Australia and uh, uh, thankfully I'm I'm a dual citizen because my mother was British and uh, so it, it, I took that plunge um, when I was much much younger to think you know what what's the harm of moving to the other side of the world and it was you know really I mean I got to thank you know people like you and I remember uh, actually I was just going to say I remember all the all, all the Scotsmen and all the Irishmen. Um, you know, like you, you and Michael Lang and Richard Hartman. I mean, I tell you what, my first Christmas here, I remember like you and Michael saying, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. I didn't have any family. And, and you know, I come up to Scotland. I was like, oh, I can't do that. It's very sweet though, you know, and, and it's been a great journey. And, and, and my entire career has been in the luxury sector predominantly. Um, and then there was a transition to the art world that kind of happened organically. Um, where I ended up working with um, a few family offices that were specializing in um, art and uh, and acquiring, you know, a, lo a lot of legal um, uh, negotiations were required in, in acquiring copyright and, you know, very boring side of the luxury sector. Uh, and uh, I, th I think three years ago now, um, I got introduced to one of the uh, principals behind the scenes here at, uh, at Maddox, um, a creative director, uh, Jay Rutland, who, uh, you know, we, we connected and uh, eventually, um, you know, as fate would allow it, um, I, I met with uh, some of the shareholders at Maddox and, uh, and they invited me to, to join their, their company as CEO. They realized that they had hit a, uh, a tipping point where to grow, they needed someone to work internally on the, uh, on the infrastructure of the business. And I tell you what, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm the, the CEO, uh, it, it's been the, the best decision I've ever made. It's, it's such a, uh, a great company to work for. Um, the, the culture is one. I remember um, uh, Peter Smith, who's a, who, who was a mentor of mine for years, who used to work for Hearts on Fire. Um, I think he's gone back actually in Boston. Um, he said the best businesses to work for are the ones where you can reach out and touch the walls and you're affecting the DNA of the business. And there is so much good stuff to, to achieve and do here that I, I just simply haven't looked back. And it's, it's been great. I mean, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I think this will probably be the, uh, the, the last thing that I ever do. And I can just see this taking me to my retirement because the, the potential of this business is extraordinary. And it's, it's only, uh, you know, we just had our fifth birthday um you know in december last year we couldn't properly celebrate it because of the the pandemic and the lockdown but um uh you know i think that maddox is poised to be a, a dominating force in not only the the art sector and the gallery sector but in the art investment sector as well you know that is certainly an industry where we are leading the way i, I couldn't agree more and you know, there's massive synergies between what you're doing and what we're doing. I mean, if you look at the art industry, you know, 10 years ago, it was pretty stuffy. It was, you know, the, yeah. it, it was, it was, it was a bit like the, the jewelry industry 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago when we started, yeah, rocks, yeah. it was really stuffy. Um, and we yeah. talk about that, how, you know, our attitude was, well, let's shake it up. Let's make it exciting, make it different. I mean, we used to play music in the shops 20 years ago, which nobody was doing. I mean, it was, it was literally as ridiculous as that. It was, how funny is you, that? Know, yeah. you know, you know, and, you know, that energy, that excitement comes across in your social activity and the, in the, I mean, I, I get all your emails through, um, you know, and, and it's a joy to, to read the insight, the interest, and you're doing it differently. And, and I guess that's what we set out to do and we still do in our industry. We do it differently. I think you're doing that. You know, I mean, I think you are doing that, Kieran. I mean, one of the great, I, mean, I get the rocks emails as well. And um, I don't sign up for a lot of jury related emails anymore. Um, but I, off the top of my head, I like subscribing to other emails because if, if nothing else, it's a teachable moment. You can yeah. see, even, even if it's not a competitor, but what is an, a, you know, a, a, a comparable luxury brand doing? With their their e-marketing, and you know, I, I signed up for yours ages ago now. I can't remember. And you know, I signed up for you know, got Tiffany and LVMH and Cartier, and 
Golgari. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you, you guys are certainly doing well is that you can see that the approach is well thought out and sophisticated. I just cringe when you see a brand, you know, clearly using, you know, a, an elementary e-marketing campaign, you know, or e-campaign e software. I won't badmouth any of them, but I'm sure you know who they are. And, you know, they're just sending out a template format uh, thinking that's going to be enough where these e-shots are powerful now you know you need to really be capturing attention and figure out what your goal is and it's all part of that journey and uh you know you're right i mean i'm smiling when you're saying it but you know 15 20 years ago the independent jewelry industry uh even the established one even the tiffany's of the world and the uh, beers you know they, they were struggling with how do we break out of the mold of what of our perceptions of what the consumer journey should be you know which is you know, uh, you, you can only sell if you're, you know, if you're an older generation and there's no music in the stores and there's, you know, it was a terrible perception. And, you know, I mean, one of, you know, we've got a phenomenal team of all ages and backgrounds, you know, um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the value that they bring is not because necessarily, uh, you know, being, you know, GIA certified, like when you wouldn't, you know, they're not, not Christie certified, they will have got plenty of, of Sotheby trained, Sotheby's trained and Christie's trained stuff. What they bring is a genuine passion. You know, they can speak passionately about the art and they, and they know their stuff historically. We invest in their training. All of this comes into play. And then when you look at the experience, because ultimately the audience that was existing 15 years ago, they're just getting older. There's a whole new audience of people wanting to consume um, and they want to consume differently. They want to, they want to, you know, the, the way that they buy, the, the experience that they're looking for is completely different. And, and, you know, you guys are a testament to that, to sort of leading the way and, and trying to do things differently. I've really got to get up to, to Scotland. Is it the, because you, are you still, I don't even know, you have to forgive me. Are you still, in the, is that, what's that, arcade? Is it the yeah, arcade? Yeah, arcade, yeah. We're, we're, That's we're, right, yeah. Yeah, we're in there. We've got, we're, we, uh... I mean, I'd be amazed to see what that looks like now. I remember the last time I was there, uh, I'd, I'd be astonished, I think. Well, it see has how much progressed. Yeah, I, think, I think we kicked everybody up the backsides really when we relaunched um, the store in there 10 years ago and everyone's moved on. And now we actually have another project we're working on in there too, just to take it to the next level. You've got to keep progressing. You've got to keep moving forward. Don't you? you can't, can't sit back. Um, let's turn, turn to art. You, you mentioned a couple of Scottish artists already today. Ross Muir, David Yarrow. You know, um, what's hot in the British art world right now? Um, I don't know the British art world. I mean, certainly Banksy is is extraordinarily popular, and I I I feel comfortable now laying claim that we're probably the the, the single most prolific and biggest dealer of Banksy works, certainly in the UK at least. I, I'd argue on a global scale, we we have to be in the, you know registering somewhere in the top you know ten or whatever it might be. Um, you know, the, the Banksy market has been extraordinary uh, in the last twelve months, and I think that's almost become a defining characteristic of the pandemic. Uh, but to, to shift slightly, you know, uh, right now, you know, our focus for this year is on artists who obey the rules of scarcity. You know, the ones who aren't producing copious amounts of work, but doing uh, a limited amount in an extraordinarily brilliant way. The Mia's Brothers is gonna be our first exhibition this year. And I'm not just saying them to plug them, that, that was a deliberate choice. The Mears brothers are from for the I mean they're, they're phenomenal artists, but for Maddox, I feel it's a career-defining turning point that we're representing these artists exclusively now. The, their, their work is exceptional. And um, the popularity, thankfully, Maddox has been able to contribute in dialing up the popularity even more. There's an interview in the GQ, in GQ magazine coming out, uh, I think in the next month or so with them um, that we've arranged. Uh, that will no doubt skyrocket their interest. Um, I'm particularly excited about these. They're, you know, uh, as the name would suggest, they're uh, a couple of Italian brothers who are remarkably talented artists, but old school artists. You know, it's almost like, you know, looking at a an, an old school, you know, diamond cutter like Martin DeWitt or something like that. You know, these guys are, uh, you know, these guys are proper painters. You know, they're really, really good. And then after that, we've got uh, incarcerated jerk face, who's this brilliant. Um, you know, a, a street artist who, who, you know, his his work is, uh, you know, he 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 doesn't do a lot of work, but what the work that he does, not only is it incredibly sought after and 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 uh, desired, but it's performing exceptionally well at auction. And then we've got the the you know uh, coming up later this year, we're, we're going to definitely be doing something with David Yarrow, 
because it's been too long since we've had him in the gallery because of the pandemic. And I'm looking particularly forward to the 10 year anniversary for the Con Brothers. Um, and th those are the ads that we kind of represent, you know, and of course, you know, Ross Muir just sold out. I mean, there's just, we're, we're kind of spoiled for choice at the moment. There is such an eclectic and diverse collection of artists, um, you know, and, you know, I've, you know, I've got a, a, a Bachner behind me in my office here. I mean, there's, it's, it's exciting times, you know, there's uh, the, the, the but, but certainly leading the way would be Banksy right now, you know, in terms of uh, the amount of clients who we've put into Banksy work who've, who've, um, you know, now have hanging in their homes. I was speaking to a client the other day, actually, once again, from Scotland, ironically enough, and he was uh, he, he was asking us to, uh, you know, if, if we want to exhibit the work in the gallery again, uh, just to save him the, the hassle of insurance because <laughs> the work has gone up astronomically in value since he's bought it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the art market is exciting and, uh, and thankfully, and, and really thankfully, because a, a year ago I was uncertain but looking back 13 months later, uh, I'm so pleased and proud to say that the art market has not only endured and survived, but it's thrived. Um, and uh, now that we're out of lockdown, I, I can only, even, I, can just, I can just see it getting better. You've talked about cause um, and I keep getting emails about it on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so in demand and collectible? You know, I mean, the cause market is is hot right now. I mean, the desire for his, we're, I mean, cause you know, uh, is is phenomenal and promoting himself as well. I mean, uh, if you if you're not following him on Instagram, I I, I I seriously encourage anyone to go and do that because uh, you know he, that's another perfect example of just a, a great artist who who managed to resonate with so many people and it causes in a completely different level. You know, causes beyond anything that's out there right now in terms of, you know, causes of the, the, is it that, that, that Hearst Banksy stratosphere where the popularity and the desire to just know what he's doing next and when's the next exhibition going to be. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the popularity is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and uh, we, we've, actually, we've actually got a cause uh, sculpt. We've got many cold sculptures in storage at the moment, but one of them is actually, I think, in the gallery at the moment. Um, and it's it's such a it's such a, 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 a you know there's there's these there's these giant cold sculptures, and and obviously the, the, you create a social media moment because you take a photo of them. They're they're immensely engaging and intoxicating, but they're also popular. I mean, the, the the amount of requests that we get from people going, "Can you source this for us? Do you have any in stock? Do you have any clients that might want to sell one?" Uh, you know, once again, it's just the popularity is uh, is extraordinary. It's a combination of the the brilliant aesthetic of the work, as well as um, the rising value of the work and its potential value over the next five ten years. And you you have an amazing immersive exhibition running currently with David Yarrow. I mean, I'm a big fan of his. He's he's actually from the same village that I live in. Is in, he really? Uh, there you in, go. In uh, Kilmacombe, nice. Scotland, and. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually hosted an event with him in, uh, in, in the Kelvin Art Gallery uh, a couple of years ago. So love his work. And uh, mm. how, how's that exhibition been received? Uh, listen, the, the, the one thing you don't have to worry about when you're doing any form of exhibition with David Yarrow is whether or not it's going to be well received. It, the popularity is extraordinary because when you look at a David Yarrow work, it's not just looking at a picture of a, of a setting that he's constructed. It's not just looking at an animal. It's not just looking at a landscape. Every time you walk past a David Yarrow image, you get something new from it. The work is so incredibly immersive and powerful and it, 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 it sucks you in like quicksand. The longer you stare at it, I mean, if you, if you stood in front of David Yarrow, uh, the longer that you stare at it, the more you realize, oh my God, how complicated, how rare was it to have captured this moment in time? And the amount of work and energy behind the, you know, that, that's, that's put in by the entire David Yarrow team uh, and of course, David himself to capture images like that is extraordinary. There's, we've got some amazing footage on our website. We put it on social media as well. And we share it with all our clients, the behind the scenes footage. I mean, David's out there. He's in the muck. You know, he's lying in the grass. He's jumping up when a lion's about to get him. Um, that's what makes David's work 
you know, you get you get plenty of people trying to imitate it. There's plenty of people out there that are, uh, you know, a poor man's David Yarrow. But mm. David's work truly is something that is so well created that you can't help not just appreciate it but value it. And uh, so the, the the current exhibition is incredibly well received. David, I right now, right now, he's been sending us images of some of the new uh, work that he's been capturing um, in the states and in Mexico and. Uh, they're phenomenal. There's no doubt they're going to be popular. And I'm very much looking forward to later this year having a, a solo exhibition with him in the gallery because a lot of those new works will be shown. And, uh, uh, you know, David is, you know, a long-term partner of Maddox and he's, and he's a friend to Maddox. And, uh, you know, we're really quite proud to represent someone of his caliber. And, and of course it helps. David is the, uh, you know, the, the quintessential storyteller. You know, I mean, I could listen to David for hours talking about some of the stuff that he's achieved. Well, and, and we did. And uh, I think everyone was wanting more to hear more from him because you're right. It's that dedication, yeah. that, that dedication. Let's turn, turn our attentions to, to watches. I know you're a watch fan, always have been. What have, got, <laughs> what have you got on your wrist today, John? So, you know, I didn't know you were going to ask this. I didn't know you were going to ask this. So I, I'm feeling like it's 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 it's. It's it's to a degree relatively dumb luck because I'm gonna I'm gonna admit something that I'm sure as a, as a luxury watch uh, professional that you are that I know you are um, that you cringe when people tell you that they wear their their eye watch but I do wear my eye watch quite a bit it is a it is a functional tool for counting how many steps which is that's, critical that's what the right hand is for that's what the right hand is for <laughs> <laughs> you're just you need a, a proper like watch on the left hand <laughs> that's it but but it's critical when you're locked down and you're sitting on your, your ass all day you've got yeah. to be counting those steps <laughs> um but when we get when we get to get all suited and booted and put put the everything back on that's when the watch needs to come out the proper the proper watch collection needs to come out um i don't want to be disrespectful with the iWatch. i love the iWatch, and it's a it, it is a tool that i use um and i do describe it as a tool but for me um no well i mean yeah i i've i, I still have i wonder if i've got a, i should have got it out earlier i've still got the very first watch i ever bought um which I don't know the model, so you're going to have to forgive me. And I apologize to the brand for not knowing the model, but I loved it. And it's, it's not nothing to express, nothing too fancy, by the way. It, it was a tag for uh, watch. And I just love the S-Link uh, band on it. And it was, it's beautiful. It's got beautiful sort of like navy blue face. I still have that watch. It's I think it was worn by favorite. the baddies in Die Hard. I think that's what, that's, the, that's what really what made <laughs> tag right. in, the, in that day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's right i've still got that one. i love that watch you know i tell you what and, and i don't know if that's the first time it's the first time back in australia now it's the first time i spent um over a thousand dollars on a watch and i bought it from a, a great a great guy um uh in australia a guy called albert ben simon in adelaide and uh you know, um, I love that watch and I still got that watch. I, I still, I think it's a beautiful watch and it's, 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 it hasn't in any, in any way, shape or form or dated. And I've always been a fan of, fan of tag. Um, uh, but there, there's a hell of a journey between that and what I'm wearing today, which is, a, a, I mean, you, you, I think you, you caught a glimpse of it before we were chatting is the, is the Patek 5990. Um, and, uh, you know, um, this is, I mean, you know, uh, for, for, for anyone watching, you know, this watch is called Travel Time. And uh, it's, uh, I was very lucky because I got it very close to the list price. Um, and, and now I think it's almost worth double the list price. Um, and uh, they've just released a version of the thing in, 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 in rose gold yeah. uh, with a blue face. And I've, I'm trying to get on the list for it because I would like to get that as well. Um, uh, the, the watch, you know, the, the, that top end. Odemar PK, Patek, mm. you know, there are certain references right now that are just so hot. And it'd be the same as the art world. There are certain pieces, no doubt, that are just so hot that, you know, you can't get and, and demand is outstripping supply. Um, and it's yeah. causing this, this crazy market right now. Um, you know, and we've got this pent up demand after COVID. We have just had watches and wonders there. There's some really, really fantastic watches came out. Odemar PK actually just released their new new models for this year, which are the most new models that they've, they've, they've launched in the last five years, as far as I'm concerned, in, in one year. I mean, the last couple of years has been kind of taken up by the code 1159. So the re-release of the new 43 mil Rolo offshore. I mean, there's just some phenomenal watches out there and the watch world is in pretty good health. I mean, I think, you know, creativity is there. I think we've all had to, you know, kind of 
sit back and look at things, haven't we, over the last 12 months? And I think, I mean, I've seen lots of creative work coming from, from the Luxury Watch world. And um, I, I, I suspect it's the same in, in your world too. You know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, the pandemics, these economic shocks do, you know, cause innovation. You know, they, 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 they help, they make people innovate and, and think differently. So I love that watch. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very one. much. It's it's a good one. Very, very kind. A lot of luck in getting this watch. Yeah. <laughs> so well, um, it's been but, an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. I know you, 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 you've, you've got to kick off. Um, um, I wish you all the best with, with reopening. I mean, we've, we've got another week to go, so I'm very jealous that you're there. Um, and I wish you all the best with your five-year celebrations when they come. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I can't wait to, for, for you to come up to Scotland again or next time down in London to pop in. Um, and uh, let's not leave it another 15 years. Definitely. Listen, I'm, I'm going I'm to come up and visit if nothing else. I want to, uh, my, my wife and I want to come back up and I want to bring my, my newborn son that we had in lockdown, uh, who's now uh, going to be 10 months this month um, to, to Scotland, you know, because his, his wife's side of the family is Scottish, so he needs to see his roots a little bit. Um, say hi to your team. I don't know who's still there. I mean, obviously, um, Grant's around. Make sure you say hi to him for me okay. as well. I'm looking forward to coming up and visiting soon. And we do this again, but we do it in person. Fantastic, John. Lovely to see you. Be All well. the best. Good luck. Cheers.